King Thor and the world of Asgard are back again, but the stakes might never be higher than they are right now. What will happen when the Thunderers past, present, and future all collide as a threat from beyond the realms themselves rear their ugly head? Well, let's hop into the pages of Immortal Thor issue number one, a brand new series from Al Ewing, and find out what happens next together, shall we? So then, as we join the book, we are greeted by a shadowy narrator who speaks to us of the realms. Well, there were always ten realms. Well, except for when there was nine but hey, let's not bring up old shit. And in these ten realms, they were filled with amazing creatures. The Aesir and the Giants, the Angels and the Undead. Each of these realms had their own gods, but what is godhood if a shadow play? And if these gods are shadows, then who are the flames that cast these shadows? Well, more on that in a minute. From there, we transition on over to Thor, who, as we see, is trying to put down a brand new ice giant rebellion. In the realm of Jotunheim, it seems that Skam Mir, one of his oldest foes, is back up to his old tricks, feeding the younger giant stories of glory that could only be won in war. In his youth, Thor probably would have smashed these guys and been done with it, but this is an older, wiser Thor. This is Thor the Allfather, who, unlike his own father Odin, actually tries to pursue a peaceful solution instead of just going right to smashing and smiting. When Skamir refuses this olive branch, Thor instead decides to prove what an absolute badass he is by willing the very clouds themselves that were just moments ago churning up an ice giant blizzard to dis disperse. Yes, that's right. Thor carries so much authority as Allfather, the very sky itself listens to his demands. The younger giants who are so filled with piss and vinegar just a moment ago turn tail and run the second that the sunlight touches their skin. Skamir, though, is a lot more stubborn and decides to stay and fight. He goes into a whole monologue how it was not so long ago that he was once the most feared magician in the entire history of the Ice Giants, so powerful in fact that he took the name Utgard Loki in honor of the old ancient god. In fact, Thor himself had actually ventured to Utgard in his youth, but he found it to be an empty place mostly filled with dust and shadow. Keep this in mind because it will be important later. Despite his best efforts, Thor is ultimately forced to fight and he ends up destroying Skamir by smashing his big icy head with Mjolnir. It's not like this is the first time Skamir lost his head either. So, naturally, King Thor finds it to be literal cold comfort when Hildegard and the Warriors 3 tell him not to worry about killing the guy. I'm sure he'll be back at some point. The question still remains for our heroes, though, why exactly are the Ice Giants causing trouble now? After all, isn't Loki, Thor's brother, supposed to be king of this realm and supposed to be keeping the peace to make sure this stuff doesn't happen? Well, funny thing about that, Loki is actually going through a bit of a major life change at the moment. In fact, honoring what was going on in the Loki solo time, title, Loki is now serving non-gender splendor. But moreover than that, they are once again acting as the god of stories, and well, you don't get good stories by sitting around being king and doing a lot of clerical work. Also, I think it's nice that Thor, A, doesn't stay mad at Loki for too long, because after all, he can't force his sibling to be a king any more than someone could force Thor to be a king. <laughs> and also that Thor instantly respects Loki's brand new they-them pronouns. Loki also hasn't shown up to the rest of Asgard completely empty-handed. In fact, they have a gift, a brand new magic wand that they gained on some unknown adventure that they believe will actually allow Asgard to repair the broken Rainbow Bridge. And oh yeah, man, the Rainbow Bridge has been broken for a long time now, hasn't it? Before the Asgardians thought it would take hundreds of thousands of years and more magic than they could muster to do the repair job, but Loki manages to get it done in a matter of seconds. But of course, this is still the Marvel Universe where all magic comes at a terrible cost. Thor is overjoyed so much the fact that he doesn't even seem to realize that Loki is troubled right now and might very well have been up to some old sinister shenanigans. Mainly because he can't wait to get back to Midgard and hang out with all of his friends on Earth, because isn't that the special thing about Thor? On Earth, he doesn't have worshippers, he has friends and allies. And when Thor finds a friend in need, he'll do everything in his power to set right what went wrong, like when a young woman tells him that one of her mutant friends is currently kidnapped by the mutant hate group Orchis. Thor flies into action and beats the ever-loving crap out of the Orchis goons. Because the current X-Men storyline is so big it really does bleed over into every title right now, even Thor. The young woman is so happy to have her friend back that they all end up throwing a party for Thor, where he throws back a couple drinks with them, and oh hey, look at the trans pride flag in the background. Man, first Dr. Charlie McGowan over in the Immortal Hulk, now this, I didn't know the Al and Al Ewing stood for ally. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's maybe the worst 
worst joke I've ever told. Can you believe I'm still single, everybody? All in all, Thor had a pretty damn awesome day back on Earth when he decides to close out by taking a trip to the Statue of Liberty. He admits that with the weird way Asgardians perceive time on Midgard, and because of his super stressful schedule as a hero and as a king, he's never really had a chance just to stop, slow down, and take in his surroundings. And now he decides to do just that, but moreover, Thor also goes out of his way to honor some of his past friends who he's lost along the way, some names I haven't heard of in forever, like Auric Thordfulson, aka Eric the Red, Aya, his friend from Wakanda, and even the original Captain Marvel. For a minute too, Thor thinks with his amazing all-father power, shouldn't he be able to pierce the veil between life and death and talk to his old friends again, only to come to the realization that that's probably a bad idea and it's good that even gods and kings have their limits. Still though, at the very least, Thor can maybe part the clouds and end this storm, surely the people of New York would thank him for some nice weather. Here's the thing though, as, as soon as he tries to do that, a massive bolt of lightning ends up hitting him. It seems that these clouds in this storm answer to another master, and that master we soon meet, as a massive, hulking, indescribable individual ends up parting the clouds. This guy claims to be Toranos, also known as the Utgardian Thor. Yes, that's right, Utgard has its own gods and their own god of storms. As Toranos explains, if Thor is the god of thunder and the god of storms, then he is the god of superstorms. The kind that strike without warning, don't water crops, and destroys everything in its path. Why is he only here now, though, making trouble for King Thor? Well, as Toranos explains, the wheel has turned. The Ten Realms have been too stagnant for too long. All of their progress, nothing but an illusion, and if King Thor and the others won't actually make the sort of progress they need to, then Tornus and the Utgardians are going to do it all by force. Obviously, Thor isn't going to be bullied by some outsider, and he's not going to take any of this laying down. He calls on the full power of the Thor Force, while also listing off his many titles and accomplishments. The Mighty Thor, Son of Gaia, All-Father and Avenger of Earth, before letting Tornos have it with both barrels. Only here's the problem, though, he shrugs it off like it's absolutely nothing, and I mean, why shouldn't he? The Utgardians are to the Acer what the Asgardians are to mortals. And if these guys really are the gods amongst gods, then how must they regard the poor mortals caught in the crossfire here? It's right here as the comic begins to come to a close, we pull out and see that the narrator has actually been talking to someone this whole time, a person who is ultimately revealed to be Gaia, yeah that's right, Mother Earth, and also revealed to be the biological mother of Thor himself. It's so crazy they keep going back to the Gaia well because that was all supposed to be explained in an Empire tie-in that never actually got released. But I digress, it's heavily implied that the reason we haven't seen a lot of the Utgardians up until now is that Gaia has actively been trying to keep them captive, but now they're breaking into the other ten realms and everyone might be very well screwed unless Thor can do something about it. As the comic comes to a close, it's revealed that the narrator this whole time was none other than the real Utgard Loki. And if the Utgard Thor is that big, that bad, and that powerful, how bad must this guy be that he's still locked away? And so that was a Mortal Thor issue number one, everybody, and I gotta say, this one gets off to a really strong start. Al Ewing does a good job picking up the spare left behind by Donny Cates, who sadly didn't get to really finish his run, given a tragic car accident, while also honoring several other big events in the other Asgardian books, including Loki, and I gotta say, it was just a joy to read. I personally never would have thought to go back to the Norse mythology well and dig up the Utgardians, especially because, as this book notes, other writers technically have done it over the years, but never quite like this, choosing to reimagine the Utgardians as ancient titans, primordial beings of immense power who are basically the god of gods, while also putting that wonderful Marvel comic spin on it. I also like, too, that their motivations aren't transparently evil. They seem to want to actually help the world advance in a way they feel has been lacking, which I cannot help but feel is also kind of a meta-commentary on long-running comic characters like Thor. Obviously, Immortal Hulk was always going to be a hard act to follow, but if anyone can do it, it's Al Ewing, and I'm definitely energized, hyped up, and super excited to see where this brand new series is going to go from here. Overall, an 8.5 out of 10. 
Hey there everyone, it's your pal Kate Joel again, and if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video, and I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers, a lot of cool stuff offering up there, exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind-the-scenes concept art for Capes and Quest, that's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and you know help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw so i want to thank you all and i will see you again next time bye bye